Uh, my name is Rob Thomas. I'm the AVP of Human Resources here at Carleton. And on behalf of uh, Daryl Boyce, the AVP of Financial, uh, sorry, of Facilities Management and Planning, and also on behalf of the working group for the prevention of uh, harassment and violence in the workplace, I'd like to welcome you all uh, here this morning. It's great to see you uh, here and taking the time, so thank you for coming. Uh, one administrative note I should point out as I look toward the back of the room, the, the session will be recorded today and will be posted on the uh, Facilities Management and Planning website uh, <clears throat> next week along with the HR website. So uh, please feel free to pass the link along to your colleagues who are not able to attend today. Uh, I'd also like to uh, just take a moment and thank the organizing committee for this event. So uh, the fact that it is being recorded, um, hopefully this will be widely distributed and will be another uh, piece in the, um, uh, in the puzzle as we build our campaign here on this topic. But these events are always a lot of work to organize, so thank you to everyone that worked so hard to, uh, uh, to get this set up. And uh, we have a, a wonderful panel here today, so I'd like to thank them all for taking the time, and uh, you'll meet them all shortly, so we're delighted to have them here. Uh, this panel today is really uh, <coughs> all about building uh, Carleton's awareness uh, and continuing to build our awareness and our commitment to, uh, on an ongoing basis, to the prevention of harassment and of violence in the workplace, something that this institution takes very, very seriously. So uh, uh, this is uh, another step in that journey. Uh, I should note that is in addition to uh, the online mandatory uh, training, so just a gentle reminder, if you haven't completed the online training, that uh, as Carleton employees, we are all required to do that. So uh, please take some time to do that if you have not. Um, done that already. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, uh, I guess, just before we get going here, I guess I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, as part of our overall uh, respect and safety initiative, and as I said, part of Carleton's ongoing um, commitment to this area, this is um, such an important topic that we all have a role to play in each and every day. Um, we all want to come to a safe, healthy, uh, happy work environment. So we all have a role to, uh, to play to, to make sure that that happens. So um, I guess I, I will hand things over to Nancy DeSellier. Obviously, many of you know Nancy. Nancy was a key organizer for this event. Uh, she's the assistant director in our, in our um, environment health and safety group. And um, uh, Nancy, along with our panelists, will uh, lead us through, I think, three scenarios today over the next hour and a half or so. So it should be a, a, very, uh, a very good discussion and uh, certainly uh, uh, one that I'm looking forward to. And uh, so sit back, relax, and um, participate, and uh, I'm sure we'll have lots of chance for dialogue and so forth. So over to you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. You've actually taken a lot of my talking points, so we're going to have to ad-lib this one a little bit. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody. It, it's a really good, uh, great opportunity to see you all present and to see everybody involved in our mission, in our mandate, to make sure that everyone is aware and that we don't tolerate any harassment or violence in the workplace, so thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank the QP2424 President, Pam griffin Hody. Uh, who helped get the word out to her membership and actually changed the meeting of the executive so that everybody could attend. So that really shows commitment. Thank you. Um, before we get started, just to give you a bit of a sense on how we're going to run today's session, uh, what we've done is we've developed three fictional scenarios that you could potentially encounter in the workplace. I'll provide a, scenario, a summary of the scenario and some highlights will be shown on the screens uh, to the side so that you can see and have a sense of what we're going through. And then each of our panelists is going to discuss the scenario and then we're going to have some time in between for questions. Um, just from a housekeeping point of view, just a quick reminder for those of you not familiar with the room that the washrooms are off uh, to my left, your right. Uh, just behind the exit sign. So without any further delay, again, and I'll echo Rob's sentiments, thank you to our panelists right off the bat for agreeing to come in and talk to us. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow each of them to introduce themselves. So I'm going to start uh, on the furthest. I'm going to start with Joy. Joy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joy Noonan. I uh, have been a labor and employment lawyer for uh, closing in on 25 years now. About uh, seven or maybe eight years ago, I left private practice. I work now full time as a labor arbitrator, a mediator, and am in the, I'm going to say, sad position of having now completed well over 100 <coughs> workplace investigations, many of them in university settings, college settings, hospital settings. So uh, I bring that to the table. Today I'm the person who is often called in as the third party neutral to assess what's going on and, and to call it. Is it or isn't it? So that's what I bring. Thank you. I'd like to next introduce Kate, Kate Dupre, who's actually one of our faculty members here at Carleton. That we, uh, I came across Kate when she was delivering one of the colloquium sp uh, speeches for the psychology department. Yes, hi, I'm Kate Dupre. I just joined the Department of Psychology this past January. I'm in the organizational psychology area. Um, prior to that, I was with the Faculty of Business Administration at Memorial University in St. John's for 10 years. Um, so broadly speaking, my research focuses on occupational health, safety, and wellness. So I'm really interested in healthy work, um, so work that is enriching and safe and ultimately effective for organizations. I've done some work on injuries, the work-life interface, young employees, leaders and well-being, and over the last 15 years now, I've focused a lot on aggression, violence, and mistreatment. So I've had a number of funded research projects in that area, and I'm really interested in understanding that workplace phenomenon in the hopes of mitigating the effects for individuals, as well as hopefully decreasing its overall prevalence in organizations. So today I'm speaking to you from a research perspective in terms of what we know about this behavior from um, the scientific literature. And finally, I'd like to introduce Kay. Uh, Kay's coming to us. And uh, I didn't mention, actually, Kay and Joy were with us back in 2011 when we first had this series of panelists. Uh, so this is a bit of a reprieve and the next step in our journey. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm Kay Roberts. It's great to be here again. Um, uh, my background is I have 20 years in policing. I was a police officer with the Ottawa Police Service and uh, Gloucester before we amalgamated. Um, I was here on the panel uh, in 2011, bringing my uh, both areas of interest and expertise. Um, when I left Ottawa Police Service, I had been working on uh, a harassment and violence prevention program uh, or project with uh, the organization. Um, introduced some concepts around human behavior, why we do what we do, um, very well received there, and made a determination that I needed to do that a little bit more full time, couldn't manage both, uh, both professions. So for the last seven years, I've been providing harassment and violence prevention training in the workplace, um, also doing coaching with respect to that. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here today. I look forward to it. Thank you very much. As you can see, we've got some great panelists that are going to be able to lead us through some of these scenarios that we developed. So let's start with our first scenario. Uh, Junior is a supervisor in the Department of Dreams. During his first two years, everything proceeded very well and he was able to meet his responsibilities quite successfully. He received good performance evaluations and he really enjoyed his job. Six months ago, Junior began reporting to a new manager, Isabel, at which point everything changed. Isabel had a very different management style and was, a, was said to be very controlling and believed that intimidation was the way to motivate your staff. Isabel was critical with all of her staff, but she seemed to pay particular attention to Junior. She found constant fault with his work and nothing was ever quite good enough. After two months, uh, Isabel became more aggressive towards Junior. She started yelling at him, calling him stupid and incompetent. And she repeated these statements in front of his coworkers and his subordinates. Sometimes she got angry, so angry that she banged her fist on the desk. Now panelists, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this scenario. So at this point, we're gonna start actually with Kay for the first one. Okay, thank you. 
Um, well, I, I certainly looked at this uh, through the, my police lens, uh, um, and I'm, I'm also very, very aware that um, human behavior is a very interesting uh, component in the workplace. It's not like we leave ourselves at the door when we walk through the workplace door. So a couple of things that, uh, that really stood out for me here in terms of the, um, the, this, this, this scenario um, is that question about is this harassment, uh, harassment and bullying, um, are we looking at uh, potential for violence here? And certainly what we're seeing um, is that in terms of human behavior, that power through aggression, um, even though we recognize that in, uh, intimidation is not an acceptable or legitimate man management style. Um, so being able to take a look at that um, and uh, observe and, and uh, recognize the aggressive behavior. Um, with respect to harassment or violence, uh, Depending on, on the intricacies of that, my sense is harassment at the front end, but uh, when we start looking at behavior such as banging the fist on the desk, um, and we look at the definition of violence under Bill 168, um, we're now starting to creep into that territory of uh, statement or behavior that uh, causes uh, the person to feel threatened or that they could be, uh, violence could be used against them. So it's certainly something as an organization we would have to make considerations around. Um, the reality is we know that there's, there's a requirement for the organization uh, to do something with respect to that. Um, and I think, I think this is where I start to inject the human behavior uh, piece, because um, the scenario does describe that um, the behavior on the part of Isabel is, is pretty much being inflicted on all of the employees. Um, in this particular case, she seems to be targeting Junior in a way that, uh, that is a little slightly different or a little bit more aggressive. Um, but you know, it, it really is about what's driving that behavior and, and what causes Isabel to believe that she can manage in that way. Is there something specific about Junior that, uh, that calls something up in her? Um, so from an organizational perspective and, and certainly looking at, uh, at um, uh, Carleton University's um, program, um, there are lots and lots of mechanisms through which to explore and, and get at the, at the root cause of this. Um, my suggestion is, is, in this particular case, it's not something that's a, that's a one-time event. Um, and based on the program, there are a number of opportunities and mechanisms to, uh, to perhaps uh, curb that behavior and actually have uh, Isabel um, uh, engaging with her, with her employees in, uh, in a more respectable um, and certainly a safe manner. Um, so I'll leave my comments at that for now in the interest of time, and certainly I'll add more when we come into the, uh, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Kate, what would you like to add? Okay, um, from a research perspective, um, we've been looking at these types of behaviors for probably about the last two decades now, and we've um, started to have particular terms for different types of behaviors. So from, for, from a research perspective, we would definitely call this bullying. So you might think about like aggression or violence or abusive supervision or social undermining or incivility, and there'd be elements of all of that in this type of behavior, but this is um, sort of textbook bullying in terms of the theory that has looked at these types of behaviors. So it's behavior that's persistent, sustained, high intensity. Um, the perpetrator has a particular type of power, um, is engaging in this behavior over time, is targeting this particular person. So we would call it bullying. Um, some people say that, you know, this is office politics, but others would say, you know, it's not really fair to dignify that behavior with that type of a term. If a child did this, we would reprimand them for it. It's just not okay. And moreover, we know from research again, we know the evidence shows us that there are many individual as well as organizational outcomes as a result of this type of behavior. So there's health outcomes, there's behavioral outcomes in terms of people being less committed at work, they're less focused on their work, they're more likely to leave the organization. Um, we also know that people around the behavior are affected by it, so we know that when people witness bullying or when they're told about it, there's also implications for them, so they're also less likely to focus on their work. Sometimes they feel very powerless in the sense that they don't know what to do, they don't know if they should report it, they don't know if it's really bothering the person. Um, so from all those perspectives, I would say that this is um, bullying, this is a form of mistreatment, it's something that needs to be addressed. Carleton does have a policy that does address it. It's the responsibility of the responsibility. Um, they've taken the responsibility to keep everyone safe. Um, people are expected to report this. Um, there are policies to deal with this in terms of how it should be dealt with. So from that perspective, there are things that should be done in this circumstance. But given um, you know, 
characteristics of the situation and people's perceptions about how the particular situation might be dealt with, people might deal with it in different ways. So I think we'll I'll stop there. We might continue the conversation. Okay, okay thanks. Thank you. Enjoy. I uh, sure. I'll, I'll just pick up on that same theme. I'm going to assume, for the purposes of a five-minute overview, that what these bullet points signify are findings of fact. So I'm going to assume there's been an investigation and that these are findings of fact that have been made. So if I'm looking at it as the investigator who's analyzing and got to assess whether or not this meets the test of workplace harassment, I look at a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we all know that motivating by fear is uh, a very uh, ineffective way to manage people. So how Isabel got here in the first place is somewhat curious to me, but nevertheless, my first question would be, who's managing Isabel? So how did we get here in the first place? Who's looking after Isabel? Is Isabel okay? Uh, so, you know, hopefully through, through the course of the investigation that will have come to light. So what we have is an abrasive manager right off the get-go who is probably creating or contributing to a toxic work environment. Um, it looks like things have escalated and it does look like she's bullying this particular employee and if that's the case, it's, it is. As you say, it's very classic workplace harassment. Basically, workplace harassment uh, is a pattern of behavior, a vexatious pattern of behavior or interaction that uh, is, it can happen if it's one very serious incident, but, but, but typically you'll see it's a pattern of behavior as a case like this. And it's stuff that intimidates, demeans, humiliates, and attacks other people. And importantly, the actor knew or ought to have known that it would have this impact. And I'll just elaborate there for a moment because it's very normal in investigations like this that, and of course you have, what, four bullet points. You can be sure there's a story. And I expect the story would be something like Isabel's intention was never to have that kind of an impact, that her intention was to motivate. Uh, her intention was to get the job done and to please her superiors. Her intention was to manage a poor performer. Again, those are intentions. Here's where it falls apart, though, is that that was not the impact. And people often believe that they're, because they have a certain intention that their impact will be similarly positive or neutral. Meanwhile, there can be dead bodies in the hallway. I mean, they, you know, they can have a terrible impact on other people. So we have an impact that humiliates, that demeans, that attacks, and that intimidates. So it's clearly a problem. Uh, Isabel needs to be managed and it needs to be addressed. Not addressed, we probably end up with a very toxic work environment. You'll end up with people on stress leave. Uh, you'll end up with people hurt. And you will lose really good employees. Thank you. At this point, what our pattern and what we looked at is, what is your feedback, what are your comments on this scenario and what our panelists have said? Is there anyone that's got questions or comments? We've got two microphones set up for you. My name is Laura Lee Archibald and I work in the Equity Services Office and I am a zone rep for Zone 2 in Robertson Hall. So, um, Kate, you talked a little bit about uh, what would happen, what, they, what people should do. And what I find is that it's about having concrete examples of, t of what Junior could do in that situation a concrete example of what um, colleagues could do when they're in faced in that situation and it's not about just kind of closing your ears and pretending it's not happening. And I would also like to find out um, about what kind of programs would help to, um, or are planned by Carlton to sort of address those issues because sometimes people just freeze and they don't know what to do and they don't know what the next step would be. And, um, and sometimes what happens, I would think that in this case, that you know there might be some retaliation on the part of the person who's being victimized because that's their, their way of reacting to that kind of situation. So anyway, I just wanted to see if you could address some of those issues. Right. Um, from a research perspective, we know that when organizational policies 
exist. Uh, they are related to uh, reporting of aggression, but they're only related in the sense that employees need to believe that there are policies with teeth in the sense that the organization will actually do something if someone does report something. So there's a lot of cases where we know there's policies, we know there's something on paper, but employees haven't seen that the organization is actually willing to take a stand and do something. And sometimes, you know, given unionized environments and given lots of other confidentiality issues and things like that, it's hard to get all the information out there. So employees don't necessarily know what, um, what might happen. There might not have been a lot of examples, you know, which is a good thing that there's not a lot of examples of this happening, but they might not have necessarily seen what the organization will do in these circumstances. So from that perspective, it's really important that, just as you said, that employees know exactly what they need to do, who they need to speak to, and what the organization will do in response to that. So it is important that organizations are providing employees with that concrete information. So I definitely agree with what you're saying, and the research would support that. And Kay and I should probably speak a little bit more too. Sure. No, do you have any other? I, I, okay. Yeah, I think the only thing I would say to that is, um, with respect to the programs and having read through the, the Carleton program, both violence and harassment, is um, you know, being able to have some sense of what are the kinds of things that might prevent somebody from reporting and or even a supervisor or manager responding um, appropriately. Um, so what are the, you know, what are our own internal inhibitions that we might have or carry that would impact? Because, you know, um, in, in terms of what Joy was saying, you know, impact really is in the eye of the beholder. So whatever the behavior was and however it is explained away um, or explained to, um, the reality is people are having a particular experience based on that behavior. So what happens for a manager or supervisor who is now being approached by someone who's having this experience, um, and that's not their experience of the thing. Right? So being able to be objective and, and refer to the policy and, and allow the policy to do what it needs to do um, uh, because all of our realities are we're going to bring ourselves to that experience. We're going to bring our own experience. We're going to bring our, um, you know, our sense of you know, what, was, you know, what was in my own history. Did I have this happen to me and I just, you know, I just water off a duck back, water off a duck's back uh, kind of um, experience for me. Um, so as a manager or supervisor, I need to be able to acknowledge where I'm being subjective, acknowledge that, because that's the reality. We are going to have our own experience of that thing and then move on from there. So being able to have those policies, um, as, you, as you say, Kate, there's, there's the teeth of the policy and then there's our ability, our response ability to be able to, uh, to let the policy do the job that it's meant to do. Do you have a comment on that one? Is there? Okay. Um, if you have no comments, we'll move on to the next question. I wanted to, um, you know, to the point that we are talking here, that the awareness. Um, what may stop a person from uh, approaching either the right authorities or even knowing about this? Um, I would speak from a grad student's perspective. Um, there are students who come in. I've seen international students coming in who were not aware that any such framework exists at Carleton. They are, um, I mean, they are crying there in the labs by the way they're being treated by the supervisor. They don't know where to go. And there's also that feeling of um, maybe intimidation. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, supervisors are sending them emails and cap locks, like yelling at them each time, yelling at them in meetings. They don't know where to go. So, I think, I'm not sure if this uh, announcement to attend this was also sent to uh, grad students because we did receive um, the instructions to fill out the online, um, you know, the online um, training we had to do. So for sure, grad students were asked to do that online training, but I'm not sure about this. However, I think if supervisors were encouraged to pass on the information of this workshop to their grad students, their labs, that would be valuable. Thank okay. you. Um, I'll just speak to that just quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Maria McClintock has been uh, in contact constantly with all of the union presidents, and the communication was sent to all of them, asking them to promote it and to encourage and make sure that all of their various members were aware of it, because we wanted to make sure that every group on campus was aware, had the opportunity to learn. Uh, and when you were mentioning about how to become aware, how to be more aware of the issues. That's why we've put so much emphasis over the last several months uh, on getting our awareness training updated and making sure that everyone across campus was going through and encouraging them to take the new version of the training. There had been a previous version 
And the new version that we put out uh, in the fall, I think it was October that we put it out, uh, it was, uh, the feedback I got was that it was very poignant, it was case-based, so there was a lot of issues in there that made you take a step back and think. And we did that deliberately and that was why we pursued that next step today with using scenarios and panelists where we could respond to very concrete examples and have people be aware of that. That helps to answer a little bit. Were you looking for something as well from the panelists or? I could just, uh, I'll just pick up on that. Okay. This is truly the most common kind of scenario that I find myself brought into is something like this. And I will say most often you will find, and it's this power imbalance situation, the, the danger is that often those on the receiving end feel very vulnerable, uh, don't understand what rights, if any, they have. In fact, some of the worst that I've encountered are where there's in, in, even a profound language barrier, right? Where you'll have new Canadians who really are vulnerable to being abused by people in positions over them. So it's, in, it's all about education, right? It's crucial that people understand their rights and that you can create a safe space for them, right? If they're terrified that by speaking up they're going to be fired, uh, they're not going to speak up. So it's, it's A, education, and B, creating a safe place for them to go. Any further comments? I'll just, we, I've done a little bit of research looking at uh, students and their supervisors, research supervisors, and you know, there's sadly a lot of aggression, violence, bullying among that group of people for the reasons Joy mentioned. Um, you know, and maybe there's not a lot of it, but what there is is very salient. So we've mm -hmm. done a little bit of research. We, I did a quantitative study at one point, and people wrote on the backs of pages stories about things that had happened to them. So there is a lot of it. Um, you know, there's stigma associated with it. So I think for the people it's happening to, it's very embarrassing, and they don't necessarily always want mm -hmm. to go talk to anyone about it. So when you're being treated that way by someone who has power or authority or someone who can make decisions about your future, um, it's, sometimes it's very difficult to do that for various reasons. So. Um, I think the more we talk about it and the more we learn about it, it will hopefully change. Um, we know from research that um, training people to interact with one another uh, with more civility does make a difference. So I think as those findings are emerging, maybe it will make a difference in terms of some of the things that we can do at different organizational levels to help train people to interact more effectively. So like in this case, it seems that Isabel thought that her style was effective, but we know it's not. From a leadership perspective, we know that that's not. Trying to motivate people by demeaning them is not helpful. It doesn't make them work better, it makes them work worse. Um, so as we learn more of that and we're able to utilize that in different types of situations, hopefully we will see a change. So I think the research is heading in that direction a little bit in terms of different interventions that are helpful to make those sorts of differences. So I guess I would just say we know there is a lot of it and I think the research is starting to support that and trying, starting to support some of the interventions that we could use to hopefully improve it for the better. And certainly now that we know that uh, we have Kate on board here at Carleton, she's probably going to get a lot of contacts for me as we pull her on board for different projects. So thanks in advance. <laughs> Just a heads up. Any other questions on that first scenario or can we move to our second scenario? No. Al? Hi, I'm Al Burns, I'm the Director of University Safety here, and I wanted to talk specifically about the training that you talked about in regards to management training. So Carlton has put a lot of effort in the last couple of years in into training of people, both on the academic and professional services side in regards to the Carlton Leader Program that was developed, and as well as uh, managerial functions training that are going on now. Specifically in each one of those sections, there are areas that deal with creating a healthy work environment how to support a healthy work environment. So the things that we're seeing in here from uh, the manager in this case is something that is definitely addressed in the types of training that's being provided to people from uh, who, from the higher management, senior management level, down to people who are thinking of getting into supervisory roles through all of that. So I just wanted to mention that training is out there and available. Thanks, Al. And actually, I'm going to take that as a bit of a plug because Tony Lackey and I are actually delivering uh, the session in the Supervisor Development Series, and we're specifically dealing uh, with 
health, safety, and violence in the workplace prevention is there as well. So thank you. Any other questions on that? And thanks for moving us. We're good? OK. Then if uh, that's all right, we'll move to our second scenario. Now in our second scenario, Veronique is a new young faculty member in the Department of Miracles. This is her very first teaching assignment, and she's been assigned to teach a third year undergraduate course attended by 50 students, equally distributed between males and females. The course material is somewhat controversial, and as a result, emotions are becoming increasingly polarized and engaged throughout the classroom. The class dynamics are definitely polarized, with three or four of the male students becoming increasingly strong in their responses. At the end of the last class, two of the male students, Fred and Ian, have stopped Veronique as she was walking out from the building and continued to voice their opinions very loudly. Veronique indicated that she preferred discussion to be limited to the class hours or to be continued by appointment within her office hours. While they weren't happy with the arrangement, Fred and Ian agreed and left. That evening, Veronique received a very aggressive email in which Fred made remarks that Veronique construed as inappropriate. However, she did not feel that they were threatening. She didn't respond. She chose to think about it overnight to decide what her approach was going to be, and in the morning, she decided not to respond to the email. At the next class, Fred was openly aggressive in his responses, making Veronique and other male and female students very uncomfortable. At the end of the class, when all the students had left, Fred again approached Veronique, and he physically inserted himself between her and the exit from the classroom. She was able to diffuse the tone of the conversation and left without difficulty. That night, she received a second email from Fred that started out aggressive, but also contained wording that she construed as threats. How would we approach this? And I'm going to start this time. Uh, certainly, Kay, given your police background, perhaps you could bring this one in, because I think that's where we're heading. Sure. Um, again, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to start with, that, uh, you know, in the, on the surface, it would appear as though there's some harassment that's going on. But clearly, um, in this particular scenario, the, uh, the individual, Veronique, is expressing some concern about, uh, about her own well-being and her safety um, and threats. Um, so whether or not we're looking at uh, criminal code offenses, obviously there's going to be some criteria that needs to be met with, uh, with uttering threats. Uh, and that test will have to be, uh, will have to be uh, conducted if it does go to that, get to that point. Um, but more specifically, with, again, with respect to Bill 168 and the definition of, of violence in the workplace, it's you know, uh, stated very, very briefly, it's the actual physical force that, uh, that does or could ca cause physical injury, uh, then the attempt to do that, um, and or a statement, um, statement or behavior that causes uh, the person to believe that there's a, there's a possibility or potential for them to be uh, to experience violence on the part of the perpetrator. Um, so, with respect to this particular scenario, I think from uh, from an investigative uh, standpoint, um, in in looking at your program, you have that uh, that checklist that uh, that identifies what kind of behavior is is taking place, and then what the responses will be, um, whether it's uh, HR, whether it's your security services. Um, but I think uh, given the escalation, um, and escalation properties are always something that we have to consider in terms of people's behavior, um, and clearly there's an escalation of behavior, and not only that, um, they're being quite brazen because now they're doing it in the presence of other people, which um, is an indicator of how uh, the aggression is increasing. Um, so I think all of these things need, need to be taken into consideration. Um, with respect to harassment, um, vexatious comment or conduct, so could be looking at that as, as conduct against the worker, um, that uh, ought reasonably be known to be unwelcome, uh, but certainly uh, this is starting to tread into because the behavior is escalating. There's some there's some inability or impeding her ability to leave the room, um, which is uh, indicative or could be indicative of violence. Again, I'm looking at this from the perspective of um, you know intent versus impact. Um, so we're you know our focus needs to be on what that experience was on the part of uh, Veronique, um, and also the reality that. Um, that she has to arrive in the workplace every day, um, and she was, you know, that these students are in her class. She's going to be, have to be have to be contending with that. So the university would have to, if, if that was happening here in this university, um, it would have to be taken quite seriously because of the reality that uh, that they're uh, they're engaged with each other on a fairly regular basis. Okay. 
to switch to Joy. Okay, um, thanks. I actually uh, very recently uh, completed an investigation very similar facts to this one. So perhaps just uh, from the perspective of the investigator, I'll add a few thoughts that I might have if you find yourself in one of these. One that comes onto my radar immediately is that Veronique is new. So she's new to your campus. She's probably on a contract or untenured. So she's vulnerable on a whole lot of levels. She knows her course is controversial, but she's going to do a great job because she wants to do well at the university. So she wants to have this situation under control. She doesn't want to make a fuss. And I think your radar needs to be on high, that this is somebody who's not going to quickly come forward. Get people involved right away. She may not know what supports she has. She may not know where to go yet. She says that she finds the first email not particularly threatening. She says that. Okay, so I'm the investigator. I'd, I'd like to think about that. What do I think if it's threatening or not? Because she's inclined to probably play it down because she's got it under control. There is a very clear baseline in universities of student conduct, and there undoubtedly is a student conduct policy here as there are at the other universities I work with. And students do have a mandate that they have to treat their peers and their professors with respect. So again, I would have that policy very much in play in a case like this, and I did in the case I just finished. So there was a harassment piece, but there was also a student code of conduct piece. I would be very concerned not just about Veronique, but also about the other students in that class. What is the messaging that is happening in that class? And what is the messaging that's coming if Veronique is not being supported and this is not being addressed? So, you know, do the students in the classroom, are they also witnessing this behavior? I would be very interested in knowing what was going on in that classroom and how it was impacting them. I would want to talk to the student involved directly. I would want to talk to this person. What does he think he's doing? Does he actually think he's being a super awesome, engaged student and they're having a really interesting debate? Is that what he thinks? Uh, that would be interesting because if that is what he thinks, he needs to understand that his impact is something very different. And maybe his impact isn't what he thinks on Veronique, and maybe his impact isn't what he thinks on his other classmates as well. But I caution that, you know, there's more than just Veronique uh, at stake here. There's a very important message that all of those students in the classroom are waiting to get. They're watching. They want to know what's going to happen here. And uh, you know they want to know if Veronique's going to be supported, because what if it's them? And uh, so that's, uh, from the investigator's standpoint, that would be my, uh, you know, what would be on my radar. Okay. Kate, would you like to add anything to this? Um, I'll just add that uh, we see a lot of this. What we typically see with aggression is that um, people who have a some sort of legitimate relationship with an organization or with members of the organization will often direct aggression towards members of the organization. So um, patients, for example, towards healthcare workers or members of the public towards security workers or students towards faculty or staff. Um, that is a very common area where we tend to see a, a lot of aggression mm -hmm. and violence. So a situation like this is um, one, one that we would see quite frequently. Um, in, this case, we tend to see that when people feel stressed or anxiety or a lack of control or frustrated with the situation, they're more likely to direct it at members of the organization. So in the situation where the students are feeling that or feeling some sort of frustration or whatever with the material, it, it, it would be a common situation where we might see that. Um, so a couple points I'd make is one thing that we know is that aggression does tend to escalate. So it's really important to stop it early. The research shows that once it starts, it's very difficult to stop it. It's easier to have the policies and training in place before it starts, because once the spiral sort of starts, it's very difficult at that point to stop it. It seems that once it starts, it's, it's more difficult to stop from that perspective. Um, and what we know is in these situations, some things that make a difference are, um, first of all, physical risk factors. So there's things that we can do to make the physical environment more safe, which in turn makes it 
less likely that the aggression will occur. So doing things like um, if someone's walking from a classroom at night, this type of situation, a classroom at night, for example, back to their office, making sure there's someone to walk with them. Um, you might want to have a panic button. You might want to possibly flag the people just in case something might happen. Of course, there's issues of confidentiality and those types of things, but I mean, you have to weigh the issues in, in making those decisions. Um, we also know that organizational administrative um, uh, policies make a difference. So the types of things that we talked about earlier in terms of policies related to the organi organization. Um, and we also know that training employees to anticipate and respond to violence makes a difference. So if an employee knows um, what to do in the situation, they tend to feel more control in the situation and they tend to be more likely to be able to manage a situation like this when it comes up. So for any type of employee to be trained to recognize these types of signs and symptoms and to intervene early in order to stop it, um, to stop it from escalating is really important. So I would say those three areas are really important in terms of the physical risk factors, organizational policies, as well as training for particular employees who are likely to encounter these types of situations. I'm just going to add a little bit on that to sort of bring in the Carlton piece for those of you who may not be familiar with it. And again, one of the reasons we chose this scenario in particular is because we do have students and staff interacting on campus. And what do you do when you have a situation involving students and staff? And that's where exactly you mentioned the student code of conduct. Because of these types of approaches, this is where the first goal would be to identify that this is a situation that is not okay. We need to engage, we need to report, and then we need to address it. Because as you mentioned, as all of our panelists mentioned, there's the whole impact that's occurring and the whole thought process, what is the student thinking? So we would certainly be engaging uh, Ryan Flanagan under uh, student services would be coming on board. And we would be having the human resources group looking at it as well, because we have to look at protecting our staff and engaging with the students and protecting the students that may have been affected by all of this interchange. So the, the key message is, uh, and I think we've, we've said it very well, is recognizing this is not an okay situation. This is a situation where you have an opportunity to stop, recognize that it's not okay, and then act. And getting the resources that we have internally to the university at all different levels are how you're going to start that cycle of change and preventing that from escalating that the impact actually moves forward. Anything else that I've missed that would add in? If I could just add in, in the case I recently did, uh, what was very useful was at the, the beginning level of the uh, conflict or dispute between the student and Verani, the Veronique in my case, we had uh, some other faculty and senior people quietly sit in on the class mm -hmm. to observe themselves what was going on because as I in, in that case as well I had a, a new faculty member trying to downplay it but word actually reached others through students who said wow you wouldn't believe what was going on in that class so uh, you know others uh, in positions to assist sat quietly in the classroom at the back and watched to see what the dynamic was and then from then we were able to take care of it. Perfect, and that's really, that's again another key message that we're trying to get across is that if you're aware of something, you don't ignore it, you act on it. In this case, it sounds like the faculty members were aware of it, hadn't actually had it reported, but still took mm -hmm. actions to try and investigate, mitigate, and then to be mm -hmm. able to assist your Veronique in this particular exactly. case. Yeah. Any further questions on this scenario? Or are we heading to our third? No questions. Okay, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it means that people understand quite well what's going on and what all of our obligations are collectively. Okay, uh, and our third scenario. Um, Lucy is a contract instructor who's been with the Department of Sunbeams for the last 11 years. And as such, because she's been there for such a long time, she's well known among the staff and other faculty in the department and she's generally part of the family atmosphere that exists in this particular department among all of the staff. But Lucy has been distracted lately. Recently, she's visibly tired, she's very edgy, and she's not her usual friendly and open personality that everyone is used to seeing. 
On one particular morning, Lucy's observed to be even more edgy than they've noticed recently, and when a colleague seeks her out to speak to her, there is evidence of bruising on her face and her arms, and you can tell she's been crying. And Lucy admits that she's split from her longtime boyfriend, and she's had to have him forcibly removed from their apartment, and she is visibly frightened. And that's our scenario as we lead in. And Joy, could you start on this one, please? Oh, sure. Um, I would say from a start point on this, you don't really need an investigator, right? You need action right away. There's not a lot to investigate beyond perhaps um, Lucy's well-being is uh, if this is in fact the case. And again, I guess it's the role that I play, but I'm very, um, I'm very reticent to ever jump to conclusions. So you may tell me that something is the case. I'm probably likely to look into it a little further. It's not impossible that Lucy's bruises are from self-harm, right? Which is a huge problem, but again, a different problem. So I guess if I'm investigating at all, it would be into understanding better what the situation is. But again, in this scenario, typically you would not have someone like me involved. You would have university services involved right away. Uh, so with that, I'll sort of turn it over to my experts. <laughs> You're all looking at me, okay. <laughs> uh, well, certainly in this case, what we would want to do, we have a number of resources that are available across the campus to help all of our staff that are in need and that are experiencing issues. As a colleague, what you would want is you would want to have a discussion, get an idea of what's going on, and see how can you help her. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our critical pieces through our human resources and through our wellness and our, our services are the, uh, the family uh, employee assistance program that will render assistance. But in an, in, if we need something very, very quickly, our health services are a tremendous asset. Although they're primarily targeted for students, they're going to help us if we need something right away. Mm -hmm. Human Resources as well has a number of skilled staff members uh, that are dealing specifically with these types of issues. We also have, I see Linda and Smita sitting there from uh, from equity, we've got a tremendous amount, and, and Al, certainly your team as well. We've got a lot of resources that have had a lot of training on how to assist, get to the bottom of the issues, and try and provide some assistance and give the right guidance. Uh, and that's what we're going to do. And you're absolutely right. What we want is we want to be able to take action and find out. If this was a case of self-harm, we need to take care of the medical issues we need to get uh, Lucy the assistance that she requires. But we need to look at it from the other point of view, and I'm going to develop it a little bit and then I'm going to push it back. Mm -hmm. uh, what we need to find out is what is the issue, because if this is not self-harm, if this has been injury that has been inflicted by her partner, then we're looking at a different scenario. We're looking at that point at a very clear case, potentially, and again, I'm not the investigator, mm -hmm. Joy, mm -hmm. you're there and yeah. certainly yeah. Kate. Uh, that there could be a potential for violence in the domestic setting. And then what, what we need to look at at a workplace level is the potential is this violence then going to escalate and accompany uh, Lucy or track Lucy uh, into the workplace. So on that note, yeah. I will turn it over. Okay, okay so I'll, 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 I'll just swing back in then as your Perfect. investigator to say, okay, so now I'm back in, we've looked into it. It looks like it is domestic abuse and uh, so then the question becomes, is there any possibility that this individual would be coming onto campus? Because, of course, that's the boundary, right? They're coming onto the workplace. So is there any possibility that this person's coming into the workplace? Historically, in situations like that, we would, we would just in case have a photo posted uh, diplomatically, but a photo circulated perhaps in the area where the person potentially could come in if it's necessary, a photo posted, but remember that's pretty dramatic. And uh, you know what, if, 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 you're not, if you're not certain that this is what it is, uh, again, think about the impact that you're posting that photo could have on that person. So be discreet if you can be, but to circulate the person's, uh, you know, what they would look like and what to look out for. And what we've done in, in past in investigations I've been involved in is to have a code with uh, the Lucy. So to have a code that she will let you know 
and there will be no questions asked if she says the code word, which can often be something unusual, but uh, it's Bugs Bunny or Dukakis or you know something that that will be the code that she needs help. I'd like to weigh in a little bit if I could. All right, and I'm also, once we're finished here, I'm certainly, Al, I'm going to have you come up mm -hmm. and discuss uh, in some specifics our programs here, so. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, this one here is, of, they're all of interest to me. This one here is of interest to me in the, in the, in the context that we're dealing with something that is a very emotional issue, and, mm -hmm. and uh, although I don't show my age, in my day, <laughs> this was something that you just didn't talk about. You kept it, it was in the house, nobody ever knew about it, nobody ever learned about it. Um, if you were a child in that kind of environment, you kept everything very hush-hush. Um, and now what this bill is suggesting is, um, not, only, not only do you have to, divulge, not so much divulge, but there's a responsibility to let the workplace know uh, that there is a risk there, um, but that other people may, by virtue of their own safety or ensuring their own safety, may have some sense of something is happening with respect to a particular worker, depending on how that, again, discreetly, how, how discreetly that information is shared. Um, what we know about domestic violence is, compared to any other kind of violence, it's all about personal relationships. Um, with respect to the perpetrator, there's a, there's a, a high degree of intensity, emotional investment, um, even, um, you know, more, more um, uh, significantly, there is power and control, uh, possessiveness that accompanies uh, domestic violence situations. Um, this idea of seeing red, meaning that you don't see anything else, you just see where the target is or where the target might be. Um, with respect to the victim, there's a fear of others finding out, fear of telling, uh, believability, um, embarrassment, shame, fear, um, the reality for many people who are, who are experiencing abuse, um, sympathy for the abuser, uh, love, hope, um, and fear are motivating all of their emotions. So, you know, your Carleton University is an organization, uh, an educational institution, um, that, you know, their primary concern is to bring people in and educate them and, and have them uh, live fulfilling lives. Um, and as a result of the bill now, um, it may mean that you have to drill down into a situation like this where you have, uh, um, you know, certainly uh, in, on the part of the victim, uh, somebody who's not uh, as, as willing and able to come forward with the information. So, um, you know, the reality for, for the university is, um, you know, are they, in terms of making, uh, making the, the environment safe, developing a personal safety plan, Joy was alluding to some of, uh, some of the things that they may do. Um, do we need to accommodate the worker? Um, do we need to make alternative work arrangements, uh, schedule changes in hours, uh, transferring uh, in terms of uh, where they work? Um, what do we do to support um, that person who's coming forward with the information or that that information is being brought to the attention of the university um, and now somebody from the university representative now has to approach um, this individual. Um, because the other thing that we know is, um, well, there's a, there will be great effort to maintain confidentiality. Um, you know, what takes precedence here is the safety of, of everybody in the university, um, workers and students alike. Um, so it is, um, it is definitely, uh, uh, um, you know, an intricate and uh, eggshell kind of, walking on eggshell kind of experience. Um, but um, at the end of the day, the university is responsible for ensuring that it's uh, safe for anyone um, because domestic violence certainly uh, can and does have the propensity to spill uh, over into the workplace. Al, I'm not sure if you're, you remember this particular uh, scenario. I'll be very, very brief because I don't have enough of the details. Um, but there was a, you know, the quote unquote in the newspapers, a manhunt uh, here in the city of Ottawa uh, for a particular individual who was, uh, who was uh, there was some concern that, uh, that he was going to harm his uh, wife and certainly ex-wife at the time. Um, and this individual went into a grocery store here in the city of Ottawa um, and uh, uh, took shots. Actually, I'm not certain that he went into the university, but that shots were fired um, at the individual's workplace, as my memory serves me. So when we're seeing, seeing red, um, there's no, we're not seeing what the collateral damage might be. Uh, we're, what we're looking at is the target. So in this case, um, where it has been determined that there is a, uh, situation of domestic violence that could spill over into the workplace, there's a responsibility for the university to take action to, for, the, uh, for the safety of all workers. And before we get to Al, uh, Kate, because from your perspective, certainly as a researcher, you would have a lot of information and data. Could you provide 
uh, a sense of this one, and then we'll we'll turn it over to Al for our, our programs here at Carleton. Okay. Um, well, some people have argued that this is the fastest growing form of workplace aggression or violence. Um, so we're seeing more cases where domestic violence is spilling over into the workplace. There is research showing that the workplace can really make a difference in terms of helping people deal with domestic violence. So if the workplace or employers um, manage it, deal with it effectively, then not only are they keeping the organization and employees safe, but they can also help that specific employee in terms of their ability to cope with the situation personally. So you know, not only is it a legal requirement to keep the workplace and employees safe, but also in the sense of it just being the right thing to do and helping your employees, there seems to be that angle as well. Um, we know that having procedures and policies in place make a difference in terms of people knowing who to report to. Um, in terms of what's been said already, there's still a lot of stigma associated with domestic violence, and we know that education about these types of topics can make a difference. So if employees are aware of these issues, if they're aware of the fact that they may escalate, if they're aware of the fact that it can happen to anyone, if they're aware of all these different types of things, then it makes it more likely that employees will know what to do in the particular situation if it happens to emerge. Um, you know, in terms of the person who's being targeted, if um, there's a possibility to allow them to have a more flexible work schedule, to possibly be relocated at work, those types of things in particular circumstances can make a difference. Also potentially identifying the perpetrator, again, if we know that there's an immediate risk or an immediate threat that could potentially be important so people can recognize the person and in turn know what to do in terms of contacting security or contacting the police if that comes up. So you know, depending upon the level of threat or risk, there's different things to do. Um, there's things to do in terms, of, uh, in terms of the target, in terms of helping them manage the situation personally and professionally, and just in terms of educating the organization and all employees more widely. Research shows that it's really important to do that in terms of ensuring that the workplace remains safe. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Al? Actually, can I just add something to right. that? Sit down. As Al, as coming. I think as Al, as Al approaches the mic, I think in speaking with, to what, what Kay was speaking to, um, if we bring our minds back to the Laurie DuPont case, mm -hmm. um, and this was the impetus for Bill 168. Now, there was Theresa Vince that uh, preceded that uh, several years prior to that. Um, but in terms of this conversation and, and why there's a responsibility on the part of the organization, in this case, this educational institution, um, Dr. Peter Jaffe testified at the inquest for the death of Laurie DuPont. Um, and I, I will be wrong in the, I, I, I might not be uh, accurate uh, uh, with the first number, but I will be with the second. There was upwards of 80 opportunities for between the employer um, and the police and family to intervene to ensure that Laurie DuPont uh, was safe. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, it, through his research, Dr. Peter Jaffe identified 44 of those opportunities, more than half, um, were available to the to the uh, the organization itself. So um, you know the reality is these people are coming into the workplace every day on a regular basis. So there's a really really good likelihood um, the organization is going to see things that um, uh, you know um, are 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 not going to be available to a more transient situation. So I think we need to be mindful of that as well. Um, that's that's a pretty significant st statistic for us to pay attention to. Sorry, Alan. Thank you. <laughs> Well, first of, all, first of all, many of the, the areas that we deal with have already been mentioned. So there's three factors I see here. There's Lucy, there's her boyfriend. So we'll start with Lucy. So first of all, if the Department of University Safety is the first contact, we're the first ones called to go over. We certainly have the ability to start the process to get Lucy the help that she needs, both uh, for her physical well-being and her mental well-being and uh, her ability to continue to work in the workplace if that's the determination that's, that's made. We're going to be working with Lucy to develop a personal safety plan that will uh, allow her to feel comfortable at work and provide her with the opportunity to, so that if something does happen, she will know how to deal with it, know how to make the escapes, know how to contact the right people. So we need to, first of all, look after Lucy and make sure that her well-being is taken care of. Secondly, there's a boyfriend. We need to do a threat risk analysis that was mentioned to determine whether there is a credible threat that the boyfriend uh, presents both to Lucy and both to those around the workplace. We do that in conjunction with the Ottawa Police Service. We'll contact them. We'll do background checks 
uh, will do everything from including having the police meet with the boyfriend and have a discussion about those issues to determine whether there's a viable threat. Um, if there's any inkling at all that there is a viable threat, then we're going to be working with the workplace around to develop a, a, a safe work protocol for the department around there. Uh, things like providing pictures that are available, things like providing um, uh, duress buttons if necessary, uh, having Lucy wear uh, a duress button if necessary, having her uh, set up something on her phone that speed dials through to us, a number of issues that can go through there, as well as providing supports to the department who of course will be going through some stress themselves and mm -hmm. the kind of supports they will need to continue working on. We talked about the possibility of having Lucy um, be accommodated in another place for, for a while. That um, is something we can do if that works for Lucy and that works for her area. But uh, the main thing here is to protect Lucy, get her back to, to uh, where she can continue to function properly, to get the department around her to feel safe, and to make sure that the boyfriend does not provide a risk. And we certainly have the training and the ability to do all of those things. Can I, uh, Thank you. Can I ask Al a question? Of course. <laughs> Stay there. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would like to build on that and say, so what do we do? because this is more and more the case. What do we do with their both employees of Carleton University, all right? So bo they both work here. And uh, this is one I face uh, fairly regularly in terms of how to manage that. In fact, uh, as Kay will tell you, Laurie Dupont was a nurse and her aggressor, uh, her killer, was a doctor in the same hospital. So uh, again, right in the workplace. Sure. Much the same. We're mm -hmm. going to be looking at uh, the boyfriend to determine if the boyfriend is an employee. We'll be working it to determine whether or not there is a risk involved. Of course, we'll get HR involved in it as part of uh, the policies that they would know. But if necessary, we'll, we'll uh, if it comes to the point where we think it's necessary, we'll make sure that the boyfriend is no longer in the workplace yeah. for a period of time until we can do a proper assessment on it. So definitely you've got to make sure that everything around is safe and that, that means that uh, we need to have this, the boyfriend, if he is an employee, um, not report to work for a period of time while we do an assessment to determine how we carry forward from that, that will happen. Thank you. Any other comments to close this one out? I think very, very quickly for me, the, you know, I, I wanted to, to not so much elaborate but speak to the 44 opportunities for the workplace to, to intervene. Um, and that's when we start to get into the human behavior piece. Why did these people not intervene? Why when it was, because the, the, the inquest revealed that there were a lot of opportunities to intervene, um, however people were not doing so out of, uh, out of fear. So I think that's, uh, you know, that's the next stage in terms of where else we go and where else we take this, because the reality for all of us is, you know, emotions run every system in our body. And if we don't gauge for the fact that emotions are running every system in our body, that's, you know, that's discovery in the Petri dish. Um, if we don't gauge for that, everything that we put in place, um, there's a potential for it. Not, not necessarily that it's going to be what happens, but there's a potential for it to, uh, to kind of crumble um, in terms of the intention and the, and the good intention and the policies and procedures and the programs. So I think we need to be mindful of that as well. Um, why aren't people speaking up when clearly there's all kinds of systems in place to protect them and make it safe to do so? So that's going on inside of them, not outside. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any questions? Linda. Of course. Hi, I'm Linda Caperald. Um, I'm having trouble formulating this question, but I was just thinking about the comment that Al made that the police would probably speak to Lucy's boyfriend. And I'm wondering what kind of control, if any, Lucy has over that, over some of these steps. Um, because while it might help us to make the workplace safe for Lucy, Lucy might in fact say, please don't talk to him, it'll set him over the edge, and I might be safe here, but I won't be safe when I'm not at work. So I'm just, I struggle a bit with kind of who has what rights and what control uh, in these situations, if someone could elaborate on that. I'll weigh in and say that what you raise is, uh, in many of these scenarios, the most difficult part of assessing, right? It's, it's the risk assessment, as has been explained. And that would certainly be part of a risk assessment, I have no doubt, right? If, if the uh, potential victim were 
traumatized uh, by any contact with the potential aggressor, I'm sure that would be something taken into account in the risk assessment process. Right? I mean, if the goal, if the end goal is, as I know it is, to keep her safe, then that that would I don't want to say definitively what, what the decision would be, right? Because it would everything is fact specific. But that said, that's hugely important, right? It is about safety, physical safety, and her emotional safety as well, right? I I, I probably raised more questions than I answered, but it, it's a very important question you raise. Kay, do you have anything that you would add to that? So oh, I'm good. Thank you for the time. Al? Certainly because Al has been involved mm -hmm. and continues to be involved with Ottawa Police with the, the, an incredibly strong relationship, I think you can certainly speak to that one. It is a di very difficult and delicate situation to deal with. But the police, when they're dealing with this, will be as part of their assessment. That will be part of their assessment. Yeah. We've already seen in this particular scenario that he's already been forcefully removed from the home. So we know that the relationship has, has uh, they are in separate places now. So uh, as the police are doing an assessment from for our point of view, uh, do we have a concern in our workplace? They'll also be doing an assessment. Is there a concern in the home? Is there a concern for the safety of Lucy outside of the workplace in her own environment? And they'll be taking measures in order to do that, whether that's setting forward for a court order to keep them apart. Um, those types of things can come in. Uh, personal safety plans for her in her home and around her home, the police will set that up as well. So they won't be just dealing with our request to assess whether there's a, a problem at the workplace, they'll be also assessing whether there's any further action they need to take in order to support Lucy and keep her safe. Okay. Maria. Thank you. Um, I guess my question really is around the issue of getting involved and faculty and staff maybe being aware or students being aware of a situation, but the reticence to come forward. And I guess, I guess I've got a two-part question. The first part being, um, I know that there are policies at Carleton and I know that there's a roadmap in terms of how the reporting and how a case would be handled in a harassment scenario. So maybe we, we could talk about that, Nancy. Um, but the other, what I was hoping our panelists could maybe address is when you encounter this in an investigation or in another scenario, how common is it that you hear people say, I, I don't want to get involved in this, this is none of my business? Um, and how would you guide people who feel that maybe they have some knowledge but really are worried for any number of reasons that they don't want to come forward. If you could address that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to refer the second part of your question to our panelists first, and then I will come in and address the, uh, the first question that you had. Uh, so the question being, how common is this reticence to actually get involved? So I'm actually going to start with Kate. As a, as a researcher, perhaps you can provide some feedback uh, from your experience and your research, that involvement factor, and that will certainly build on what we just talked about, about the Laurie DuPont case and not getting involved. Okay, what I've seen from a research perspective in recent years, there's been a lot of focus on sort of bystanders or third party effects or indirect victims. So there's been a lot of work looking at what does mistreatment, aggression, violence, abuse of supervision, what does it mean for the people who like, see or hear about it happening, but they're not the direct victims of it. So. Um, I said this earlier, but we know that those people experience a lot of the same outcomes. So they experience health effects, um, they feel helpless, they don't know what to do, their work suffers, um, they're talking about it. So there's organizational implications, um, not only in the sense that they're not getting their work done, but potentially a negative reputation for the organization. If so people are saying, this is what's happening in my workplace, because people talk about these types of things, then you know there's all those sorts of outcomes. So we're the where I haven't seen a lot of focus is on people's reluctance to get involved. What I've seen more of is people don't know what to do. I mean, people do tend to want to do something, but they really don't know what to do. So they don't know if it's appropriate to get involved. 
Um, they don't know what they should do. They don't know if they should report it. They don't know if the person wants them to intervene. They don't know who to go to. So the policies tend to be more specific in terms of dealing with the perpetrator and target, but not those people who are indirectly affected. And we're definitely, from a research perspective, moving in that direction in terms of trying to understand what would make indirect victims or indirect bystanders, what would make those people intervene or report it. Um, so from what I've seen, people are interested in helping other people in the organization. When they see that happening, they don't think it's okay. There are implications for them, but generally they are unsure about what to do. And from an organiz organizational perspective, I would say it's important to ensure that people know what to do. So you're not the person who's being directly affected, but what are some options for you if you see that happening? Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'm going to speak on this on two fronts. The first is um, the process itself and ensuring that the process is working and, and not just, uh, uh, you know, incident to incident, but that, the, again, the, the organization has a, has a sense that the programs and the processes are working. Um, so it becomes really, really difficult um, uh, when we have a situation that perhaps is, is a well-known situation and everybody's waiting to see what the organization is going to do with that. Um, and then based on that, the degree of trust that the organization and the people working within it, um, the degree of trust that they have in that system and in that process. Um, because if there is no trust in the process, again, I go back to no matter how fail-safe or fail-proof the, the program is itself, um, if the people don't have a trust, and, and it's going to be an individual thing, I mean, for any organization to be a respectful organization, it doesn't happen at the level of the collective. And I'm sure if we go back to the video from the last time I was here, I said that. It's not going to happen at the level of the collective first. It's going to happen at the level of the individual. So if at the level of the individual, so if I don't have a faith or trust in that system because I've watched somebody else move for, go forward as a third party complainant um, and report something, um, and then I started watching the dismantling of that individual, um, I'm going to probably you know, second guess myself and give it a second thought as to whether or not I'm going to come forward with, a, with, a, um, with information. So again, I, I think it's really important for people to know what to do. Um, and then when we know what to do, then it becomes a very, very individual belief system experience in terms of what are my individually held beliefs, uh, what do I know the beliefs are of the organization that I'm in, and I'm sure you can walk anywhere in Carleton and you would see um, information that lets people know that this, this is a respectful workplace. And then what about the subculture of the workplace? And I'm not talking as in good, bad, right, or wrong thing. I'm talking about how do we move through this experience called work, and in this particular case, an educational institution. And that's going to, oftentimes, um, even when I know the information, if, I, if there is a fear component, my survival strategy, the survival mentality is going to kick in, and it may very well be something that stops me co from coming forward. Not in every case, because we're all different. We all hold and carry ourselves and have our belief systems that we have. Um, but that is something that we have to factor in in terms of what's driving this process and how, you know, are, you know is it the most effective? Do we need to explore um, that whole concept? I mean, we, we won't often talk about the subculture because we think that it's a bad thing and it isn't. It really is just about how do we move through our world on a daily basis in our, in our workplace. And in this particular case, um, the workplace called Carleton Place, how do we do that? Um, and are there impacts that are, that are causing our program to, you know, to, that we need to revisit the program and say, what else do we need to insert here in terms of making it not only be safe, because it can be as safe as we want it to be, but do I feel safe? in bringing forward that information, making that complaint, um, you know, having the conversation with someone as opposed to about them. Um, there's lots of things to factor in there with respect to uh, Maria's question and comments. Thank you. Joy? Uh, from the point of view of the investigator then, I would say for any one of the three scenarios that we've covered so far, it. Uh, it's not unusual for, for an investigator to meet people who are nervous or reticent to share at all with you. This is, again, on any one of these scenarios. Um, so all I need is one. I need one person or I need some knowledge that something's going on and I need a mandate as the investigator. 
And once I have that mandate, I will have the employer direct those people to come and meet with me. So I'm not offering if you'd like to. <laughs> because you know what? I'm, uh, unfortunately, I can't give you that luxury. Many will want to, but it's actually more comfortable for them. It's sort of like the, you know, being served with a subpoena to go to court. Well, I'm not here because I want to be. I, I have no choice. So you know what? Help those people out by not giving them a choice. They will be directed to come and meet with me they'll immediately be reassured that it has nothing to do with them and that they're not in any kind of trouble at all. But typically, what the fear is, is of retaliation. And that if, they're, if the person involved or the alleged aggressor knows that they spoke out against them, they too will be targeted. They will then also become a victim. So they're nervous. And again, this is something I deal with in virtually every investigation I do. So you spend the time at the beginning of that process to reassure them that, it, that, that they are in no trouble, first of all, that the process will look like this, and you describe exactly what the process will look like. This is actually a place where very often um, I, having a union representative present with the person being interviewed is a tremendous help because the person will feel much safer. And the union representative typically for me is an asset to have in that kind of a meeting. I talk about what steps I will take as the investigator to try to keep them safe, but again, I'll be completely candid in terms of once I write a report and I hand it over, I can't promise anything after that. But there are a lot of things that we can do in the way we set reports up by keeping things anonymous, by using you know, numbers and letters for names, but again, even saying all of that, you know, if there's a particular situation and you were the only witness, people will figure out that it was you. So then comes the backup piece, which is, of course, there are very strong policies in place against retaliation. And typically, people aren't as aware of those. So that if they believe that steps are being taken to retaliate against them for having participated in a process like this, that they need to know who to alert right away. Often, I'll tell you, they alert me. And that's fine, because I know who to alert. So it's an education piece for them. It's about taking away, from my perspective, taking away that discretion so that they don't have to be seen as somebody who voluntarily went in to rat on somebody else or voluntarily participated. They have been given no choice. They've come in. If we need to keep it anonymous, we keep it anonymous to the extent that's possible. And then to the extent that retaliation could occur, they are well versed in what the policy is, what their protections are, and who to call. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions at this point? Otherwise, I'll uh, answer the, sorry, the second. Wasn't... Sorry. <laughs> um, so I think this question should be directed to Joy. Joy, I'm just wondering. Uh, you know, you would be kind of a last case scenario type, type thing when you have, have an issue and you have to come and investigate it. So, from an internal perspective and from an employee perspective, where do you think the best place to start um, when an employee has an issue? Do you think they should be going to? human resources or equity services or safety. Obviously, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, but from an efficiency uh, standpoint, wh like where would you uh, look to start from? I, I guess if it were me, I would wander first up to HR. Because I would know then that I will tell HR what's going on, and they will direct me as to where I need to go. To, you know? Now, again, if I were to wander over to security and say I'm frightened, I expect security would take care of that piece and send me over to HR <laughs> as well. But typically in my world, in the work I do, everything seems to come through HR initially. HR are usually trained, right? have some sense of what the obligations are, what action needs to be taken right away, so they'll jump into it and direct the person where they need to go and possibly alert the other areas that need to be alerted. Yeah. Claudia from Biology. I have a question uh, related to case number two. Um, I've worked here for over 25 years and the interaction between um, employer and employee and the responsibilities of both proper work conduct and, and the being held accountable for doing it you know, in an appropriate manner hasn't, I mean there's some sort of understood way of, of interacting that hasn't changed significantly in 25 years. But what has changed significantly is the interaction between students and faculty and or staff. Those boundaries that happen um, sort of are consistent between employer and employee 
are not the same for faculty, staff, and students anymore. The boundaries of interaction used to be at the university. Now email, all those things create situations where students are impeding, it's sort of introducing themselves into your home life and in the ways, as the example states, that are um, inappropriate, um, are gray zones, cross boundaries, but the understanding of being held accountable, I don't think that is equally understood from the student's perspective. It's not an employee-employer interaction, but it happens even more than employee-employer interaction. So how does an employee address that? I don't, I don't feel that there are clear guidelines for me to follow um, if that is happening. Whereas if it's between me and my boss, it's pretty clear. So what is there at the university in terms of training for us to deal with that sort of thing? Okay. Um, on this particular point, as you know, things have been evolving. The, the whole focus that Carleton has had on the uh, prevention of workplace violence and harassment really was where we took an opportunity to look at this when the legislation was being introduced. It gave us a focus and an opportunity to re-examine every part of how we interacted. Uh, so we've been on a journey for the last few years. That being said, uh, there has been tremendous amount of work as well at the student level to educate the students on what is acceptable, what is unacceptable through the student code of conduct. And uh, certainly from any of the, uh, the feedback that I've received, it's being addressed, it's being looked at, and any of the situations are addressed on that basis. So the code of conduct really dictates how the students uh, are interacting, what they have to adhere to, and how it operates. As far as um, information being provided, or I think are you asking what we're giving to the faculty and the staff to mm -hmm. be aware of those boundaries? Mm -hmm. If that's what you're asking, part of it is through the education and the training that we're starting to put together, we're still very much at a baseline process of developing, putting the basics down and the foundational elements of what is okay and what isn't okay. Mm -hmm. We've certainly seen uh, through the media and we're seeing it not just in a university setting, we're seeing it in a high school setting, we're seeing it all over about uh, cyberbullying, the, the evidence of computers and certainly with email and the like coming into the case. We saw it most recently at our sister university over at the University of Ottawa mm -hmm. where that media was being used for very inappropriate and unacceptable mechanisms. So as we're evolving, our technology is evolving, what we're finding is people are finding different ways to interact that no longer meet our values. Mm -hmm. And as we continue to navigate, what we need to do is implement training processes, put in cues, put in opportunities for our supervisors, for our staff, to really understand what those boundaries are. The students are younger than us. They're using these new technologies. They're moving in ways that we're having challenges trying to accept. Uh, as a parent, when I look at some of these behaviors, I, I sort of do reality checks with my children to see if I'm the only one that doesn't see this. So we are in a time where things are happening very rapidly, but what we need to make sure is that our staff and our uh, have the ability to know that they can come to us with these questions and how we can work and how we can interact. Well, certainly I, I would like to hope that through our training and through opportunities like this one where we're bringing in discussion we're asking, and that's why all of these scenarios were put down specifically with teacher and student interactions because that is a reality. And it is something that we need to discuss and therefore for part of our training ability is to give you this information and having this discussion where you're saying this is not okay. So I'm hoping that this is one of those steps that we're taking and certainly as Lizette has mentioned, any of the situations that we have had that have gone to human resources, they're, they're being addressed. They're being addressed at the human resources level, they're being addressed at the faculty and departmental level, and they're certainly being addressed with the student affairs level as well. Everybody is working together because our goal is to establish a culture where everyone understands respect. Safety is a given, 
but we have to have that culture of respect and we're moving and the tremendous strides that we have made, I think are, are showing, we're seeing it all across campus. I hope that you are as well. Do you have any other questions? Um, okay, if there's no other questions, I'd just like to sum it up a little bit. First of all, this was a tremendous opportunity for discussion and uh, I really wanted to thank all of you for participating and for asking the hard questions. I wanted to thank all of our panelists for being here. Not quite knowing what you were going to be facing, you saw, two of you saw it uh, back in 2011, uh, where we had a lot of, I was told more questions at that point, but there certainly, the messages that are coming out of this are fairly consistent where we as individuals and where we as an institution have to make a really clear commitment is to getting involved. And I was particularly struck when we're mentioning that not only as a bystander, so not only are we able to affect change on the immediate situation, but if we're not affecting that change, that's the part that's resonating with me, that as a bystander, as the person standing next to a situation that's unfolding, we're subject as well to negative health effects we're subject as well to having a negative workplace because we're not addressing it, we're not taking the actions, we're not taking the steps to make positive change into our workplace. So that is something that we all have to remember that we have that role and that we have to take care of it. Uh, the other part that resonated, I hadn't realized the statistics where there was 80 missed opportunities to interact to prevent a woman being killed. 44 of those in the workplace. That's a tremendous missed opportunity where this person's life no longer exists. We've had that opportunity and we want Carleton to be a place where we leverage those opportunities. When we have an opportunity to make a difference, to make a change, we have to take that change. Clearly, all of the discussion that we've heard as well is that it comes down to the individual. As the employer, the employer has a clear responsibility our committee, uh, our workplace committee uh, to prevent violence in the workplace, we all have a role and we're developing uh, policies and programs together, but each individual has the responsibility, but more importantly, has the power to make that change happen. Uh, and the one part I think that came across, and certainly in, in some of the comments that I've heard, is you've essentially given as well the university a mandate, is that we have to, through concrete actions, to be able to demonstrate that these programs and that these policies are effective. We've got tremendously skilled departments and individuals that are leading up these initiatives through Department of University Safety, through Health Services, through Human Resources, with the Environmental Health and Safety Program. Uh, we've got all of these working together and we've got tremendous people in there that are working on your behalf to change this culture. And because I'm health and safety, I deal with compliance. We've got the, the legal responsibility to act and to prevent harm and to prevent damage. But far more importantly than that, I think we've got that tremendous power that goes far beyond any legal responsibility. We have, we have that personal obligation to be able to prevent uh, this negative culture from being a part of what we're going to have at Carleton. We want to identify any potentials for negative that are still there and we're going to address them and we're going to change the culture. I came here because I wanted it to be a great place. It's a, Carleton is a wonderful environment to work, but we've all got that ability and that role that we have to play to take care of it. So one more time, please, thank, I'd like you to join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Now on your way out, there are some pamphlets. If there's any, now we're finishing it right on time at one o'clock. Um, we do have pamphlets at the back and on the back of the pamphlets we have actually a website. It's called the Respect and Safety. If you have questions or there was something that was bothering you, something that you didn't feel comfortable perhaps bringing up, please make use of that website. It'll come to us and I'll be working with our panelists if there's anything that you have questions about and certainly with our internal groups here. So once again, thank you very much.